Um, I'm here in Bethesda, Maryland this morning, and it is bright and early this morning. I'm really excited to be here to present this webinar to you. And I want to thank you for coming from all over the world to attend this presentation and to thank National Geographic Learning for having me as a presenter. So I'm really happy to share my story with you today and to share my ideas about how you can inspire environmental response. Okay, so I want to start the presentation this morning by asking you all a question. In your words, what does it mean to be environmentally responsible? And if you have just a couple words or a sentence, can you just type some of your responses in the comment box so I can share those, everybody? OK, what do we have? Be kind, conserve, be green, sustainability. These are all great answers. What's happening in the world? Conserve and respect. These are wonderful. The, know the consequences of your action. Take care of everything around us. While well, you guys have some, oh, I love this one. To help save our forests and to be responsible per, for preserving parts of the planet. So these are all correct answers. And I think it just depends on how you interpret you know, this question. I can share um, what my answer was. Here, I'm getting a couple others. Act locally, think globally. That's a great one. And we're going to talk a lot about that this morning. So my answer to this question, and I thought about this a lot, was to protect the earth for future generations of humans and animals. And I say that because I'm really a conservationist. I love wildlife. I love animals. But of course, I also love people. And I want to protect this planet not just for my children and my grandchildren, but also for the animals and plants that we share the earth with. Because I think that they're important to our health and well-being, but that they also have intrinsic value. So the reason I bring this up, environmental responsibility, is because if you guys watch the news like I do, you probably get a little overwhelmed by some of the big environmental issues that we're facing. You know, you hear about climate change, biodiversity loss, deforestation. These are really big issues. And a lot of people look to young learners as hope for the future. You know, they hope that, as they should, that these young people can help us to solve these problems in the future. And I think it's really tempting as educators and as people who care about the environment to show photos like this one of deforestation in Borneo to young learners and to teach them right away about these big environmental problems. But I think we can really overwhelm them with negativity if we go straight into these big environmental problems. For me, the first step to inspiring environmental responsibility in young learners is to help instead to create a positive relationship between nature and young learners. This is one of my favorite quotes about environmental education. It's from author David Sobel. If we want children to flourish, to become truly empowered, let us allow them to love the earth before we ask them to save it. And that, that quote really defines how I think about environmental education for young learners. I really want to try to connect young learners with the earth, with their backyard, nature in their backyard, wildlife in their backyard, so that they can have this positive relationship. And today I'd like to share the story of how I fell in love with nature, how that initial wonder and curiosity has led me to become a conservationist, and how I think that you can inspire your young learners to care about the future of our planet. So as Dave said, I'm a conservationist and a wildlife photographer and a National Geographic young explorer. So I have a pretty fun job. I can't complain. In fact, I think it's, it's one of the best jobs in the world, except for maybe being a young learner uh, <laughs> classroom teacher, because you guys get to go out and really make an impact in these young learners' lives on a day-by-day -day basis. But this is a photo of me in my office. Essentially, I'm in the rainforest of Peru taking photos. And I've devoted my career to going into some of the world's most remote places, like the tropical rainforests and remote tropical islands, 
to bring back stories of rare and endangered species and the people who study and care for them. But my journey to becoming a photographer and a conservationist, it didn't start in some far away place. It actually started in my backyard. So I grew up in North Carolina, which is a state in the southeastern United States. And when I was 11 years old, my father, who was an amateur photographer, gave me my first camera. And it was really through my camera that I first became interested in nature and natural history. These are some of my first photographs that I took all in my kind of backyard in my neighborhood. And I would explore nature. I would spend an hour looking at an anthill and watching ants come in and out, in and out of the um, anthill with my camera kind of poised at the ready, ready to take photos. It was through the camera lens that I watched butterflies going from flower to flower. And I became interested in details. And I started to share my photos with my friends and family members. So I would take my photos to them and I would say, look at this amazing bluebird, like in this photo here. And what I realized is that photography had this incredible power to make people aware of their environment. It made them aware of the things around them that they had never paid attention to before. And through this experience, I started to become a photographer that wanted to use photos to make people care. You know, I think photos can help inspire all kinds of emotions. Um, you know, they can be beautiful. They can also help inspire wonder in people. So this is a photo of a tiny chameleon from the island of Madagascar. Do we have anybody from Madagascar here today? That would be really neat. This is um, a chameleon that is a fully grown adult. So it's really, really small. And I put it on a human finger so you can see just how tiny it is. Amazingly, it's not even the smallest species in Madagascar. The smallest one can actually fit on the head of a match. Photos can also make us care about species and places that are really far away from our homes, like this photo of a Sulawesi crested black macaque from Indonesia. And I saw earlier that we had somebody from Indonesia on this webinar, so that's wonderful to see. Photos can also make us aware of environmental issues, like the overfishing of sharks and other big fish that are found in our oceans. And this is an issue that's happening worldwide. So it was really this understanding of the power of photographs that inspired me to apply to National Geographic for a Young Explorers grant to go to the country of Peru to photograph conservation efforts in the Amazon rainforest. I actually, I just got a great question. Do I get scared? Yeah, sometimes <laughs> I get a little nervous when I'm out in the forest, but it's absolutely worth it every time. Um, but, you know, I really love, I love being out there in the forest. And in this case, I spent 10 months in the Amazon rainforest and I was photographing these conservation efforts from the high Andes mountains, seen here, all the way to the low lowland Amazon rainforest. To make photos like this one, I would have to get up at 4 o'clock a.m. in the morning and drag myself out of bed and go into the dark forest in the middle of the night and to climb a radio tower that was about 60 meters high or 180 feet high so I could be above the canopy at dawn. But I wanted to do those things to really show how beautiful these landscapes are and to make people care about them. And Peru, Peru is full of adventures. You know, in this case, we had to trek for a couple um, of hours through the forest. We crossed rivers 11 times, and then we camped in the forest for 10 days in Peru. I was working with these park rangers who were monitoring wildlife. But we went out there so that we could really show some of the animals that were living in this forest. I got to photograph some pretty cool critters like mustache monkeys in the Peruvian Amazon, uh, scarlet macaws soaring above the canopy, and even some smaller creatures, because I really love to not just show the big charismatic animals, but the more the rarer creatures, the ones that are overlooked. So like monkey frogs, 
these really cute little frogs that are found in the understory and are a little bit camouflaged. And I've, I'm telling you about Peru because it was a really great learning experience for me. Of course, it was an adventure, but more than that, it was a learning experience because I got to work with students. As part of my project in Peru, I was able to give presentations and photo workshops to students in schools. And these are some of those students out bird watching in one of the forests. And as I shared my photos of wildlife with these students, like the mustache monkey or the scarlet macaw, what I realized is that these students had almost never heard of these animals. They actually knew more about elephants and giraffes in faraway Africa than they did about the incredible animals that are found essentially in their backyards. And that was a very important moment for me as a photographer because I really realized that we have to connect kids with nature in the places where they live. Kids are not going to care about protecting wildlife if they don't even know that these species exist. So now I just want to, I actually am really interested to hear about your experience with kids going outdoors. So I'm just going to launch a quick poll. And I'd like to hear about, let me just go ahead and launch this poll. All right. I want to hear about how often you all take your students outside to play or take breaks during the school day. So if you can go ahead and just answer this question, I'll just give it one minute and then we're going to tally up and see the results. All right, we're getting, got 90 responses. And I'm seeing some comments also in the comment box, almost never, a few times a month, at least once per day. And some of you are telling me that that's not even possible where you are. So that's, you know, that's definitely, it just depends on what the options are. All right, I'm going to give it just one more minute. In Singapore, once a day, we've got, it's too cold outside. That's, a, that's an interesting question. OK, you said, what's the question? Um, how often do your students play or take breaks outside during the school day? All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the voting. We've got about 50% of you have responded to this question on the screen. So let me end the voting. And then I'm just going to show you guys the responses. All right, so. I think that you can hopefully see this. Um, so what we're seeing is there's, a, there's some variety in the responses. Some of you say multiple times per day. Some of you say at least once per day, a few times per month. You know, and, and I know a lot of you say um, in the comment box that you didn't have the opportunity to take kids out at all. Um, so I think that this is a really important question to ask you as teachers because um, you, you actually aren't able to take your students out into nature. And I bring this up because, oh, I heard you can't see the results. Let me see if I can, aha, share the results. All right. Now you hopefully can see the results. So I bring, I bring this up because I want to talk about the fact that kids don't get to go outside in nature that much anymore. And we're especially seeing this in the United States um, and the United Kingdom where there's been a lot of research where kids are spending less and less time outside. So maybe kids aren't exposed to nature and these wildlife um, experiences because they're spending less and less time playing outside. And in 2009, there was a big survey that was an international survey that asked mothers how often their children explored nature. And in this case, um, children actually were not exploring nature that often. So the percentage of mothers who reported that their child explored nature on a regular basis was very low in most countries. You can see here in China, 5%, in the US, 33%, in Brazil, 18%. So that really, I mean, I think that's a different experience than maybe many of us had when we were younger. You know, if I talk to my parents, 
they say that they got home from school and they spent their entire afternoon or evening outside playing until they came back for dinner. So I think this is an important thing to look at, this trend of spending less and less time outdoors. And this really influenced my desire to create photo projects that would help connect people with nature in their backyards. So when I returned from Peru, the first projects um, that I started working on were in Pennsylvania. And I worked on this project called Meet Your Neighbors, which was an international nature photography project to help connect kids to nature in their backyards and to introduce them to their non-human neighbors. So you can see me here in this photo studio out in the forest. And what I actually did was take a plastic sheet of um, white plastic and I would place the animal very carefully so as not to disturb it onto this background. And I would take photos that would create these beautiful white backgrounds and would allow me to blow up these animals to larger than life sizes in photo prints. So here you see a turtle. On this next slide, you see a butterfly. And these prints would be blown up to you know, a meter wide. So kids could suddenly pay attention and see the details in these incredible animals. And it was a really great experience. One night, I went into the state park and I photographed moths. And these are all moths that I photographed in one night in this state park. And even I was just astounded by the diversity and color of these species. Um, and, and I really got to know these species in a way that I hadn't before. So I worked with educators, young learner educators, in the state school system, in the state park. And we created a photo exhibit that showed these prints in very, very big prints. And we also created some education packets to teach kids about the species that they might see if they went out and really paid attention while exploring the park. And the really neat thing about this project is that adults who had been going to this park for their entire lives never knew that these species existed. So I think that it's a really great way to connect kids with the amazing nature locally. And so although I did this near my home in Pennsylvania, I've also taken this idea of nearby nature to other countries where I visited and worked. And as Dave said earlier, I spent about six months in the Indian Ocean um, on the island of Mauritius last year, working on a project to document Mauritius's endangered species. So I was working um, with the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation, which is a local nature conservancy that wants to talk about species conservation. So I just have a quick question for you guys. Do you know what this species is? You can, you can just type in, aha, I'm getting it. You guys are all getting it. It's the dodo. It's the dodo bird. So Mauritius is really famous for being the former home of the dodo. And the dodo was this bird that was driven to extinction within 100 years of its discovery. The dodo is kind of a mascot of Mauritius. Every kid knows about it. But kids don't know about the species that still live in the country. And so I started to work with the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation to create a project where we would create compelling images of these remaining species to help reconnect kids with nature. So here's one of those species, and this is actually a pretty incredible story. This is the Mauritius kestrel. And at one point in the 1970s, the Mauritius kestrel was the rarest bird in the world. There were only four Mauritius kestrels left in the entire world and one breeding pair. And a lot of conservationists thought, well, gosh, this is gonna go extinct, just like the dodo. But instead, some conservationists came together and started an innovative captive breeding program. And now there are over 300 Mauritius kestrels flying free on the island of Mauritius. So it's a pretty incredible story. So we photographed the endangered species. I also photographed the more common species, like this Mauritius ornate day gecko. 
This species runs around in people's houses all over the island, and yet most people never take the time to look closely at it. So we were trying to show these species, the ones that aren't endangered yet, before they become rare or threatened. And I didn't forget the plants, because you know we often overlook plants. Um, this is the Cafe Marone, and it's one of 50 species of plants in Mauritius that is critically endangered and has less than 10 individuals or 10 plants of this species remaining in the wild. It also has a really cool story that might appeal to this group. It was thought extinct in the 1980s and then was rediscovered by a schoolboy. Uh, so I think that's a pretty incredible story about how young people can really make a difference for science and the environment. So in addition to images of plants and animals, I was also photographing the people who were making a difference in Mauritius for conservation. This is a, an Aldabra giant tortoise, and it's pretty funny. He's actually on a scale getting a checkup um, to see how he's doing in his new home on this little island. And this was not even the biggest tortoise that went on these scales. Uh, but I really wanted to show that people can make a difference for animals. Here's another researcher holding a Mauritius giant fruit bat. Um, and this bat is really, really cute. Um, it's one of the, it's the only native mammal species on Mauritius, apart from some other little tiny bats. And I really wanted to show that conservation is in our hands and to empower young people to know that they could make a difference. And so we created this series of photos into an exhibit that went around to schools and museums across the country. And for many of these students, these images represented their very first exposure to these species. So I think this type of effort is incredibly important, this effort to connect kids with nature. And I, I just want to take one moment, if you guys can imagine with me what it would be like if we connected kids to nature in their backyards everywhere. If we did it really effectively, if we made young learners care about being environmentally responsible, we might not even need international conservation organizations, right? If we all protected the forests and rainforests in the places where we live, we could make a huge difference for conservation. And so that's kind of my big vision for the world. And that's what I'd really like to see happen. And you all are the people that really make that happen on a day-to-day -day basis. So that kind of leads me to my ideas for how you can use photography to inspire environmental responsibility in your students. I don't think it's only a matter of showing kids photos. It's also a matter of allowing them to take photos, allowing them to use photography as a mode of connection and expression. Yeah, I see a great comment. It starts by educating children. I think you're absolutely right. So I just want to ask, how many of you are using photography right now in your classrooms? Are any of you using photo projects or digital cameras or photo-based um, projects to teach? OK, I'm seeing some. Great idea. No, but I'm going to get on it. OK, great. I'm glad. That's the, that's the point of this webinar is to inspire you to do it. OK, some of, some of you say you use it very often. And you teach Photoshop. And you use National Geographic books with pictures, iPads, to take photos. So this is great. So it's good to hear that this is how you're using photography already. So as we talked about earlier, kids are spending less and less time outside. And I think it's easy to kind of demonize technology, right? To blame screens and computers and cell phones for kids spending less time outdoors. But at the same time, I really think we have to acknowledge that kids are going to have technology as a part of their lives. And our young learners are going to grow up with all of these digital technologies. So I think the question for me kind of becomes, how can we harness these technologies? to inspire kids to connect with nature. And I really think that cameras are one of the best ways to bridge that gap. So I've come up with a few photography projects that you can use in your young learner classrooms to connect kids with nature. And just in case some of you aren't photographers and you don't know that much about photography yourself, 
I've also created a list of tips to help you teach photography in your classrooms. And as Dave said, we've got a package for you to take home, but right now I'm going to share some additional projects with you as well as some tips for how to teach. So the first project, it's one of my favorite to do with young students, is a photo scavenger hunt. So what you're able to do with a photo scavenger hunt is provide a checklist of possible things for kids to look for with their camera. You can use circles, for instance. So in this case, we found circles in mushrooms and flowers and in this beautiful spider web. Or you could also ask them to look for patterns, for repetitive patterns. And you can do this with any number of things. You can look for colors or different shapes. And what I recommend is, that you try a series of assignments. So you give them this little checklist, which we've actually prepared for you. And then when they're finished, you gather up the photos and look at them together. So you look at how each student has seen circles or each student has seen triangles. And what you'll see is that all of these kids have a different creative interpretation of nature. This activity really teaches observational skills and it gets kids to pay attention to nature in a way that they hadn't before. They really kind of transform their relationship with the environment. Kind of one of my, my favorite experiences with this was a girl who went out in her schoolyard. Um, we took her out, took the students out for an hour. They went out and looked and photographed. And she told me later that she started looking at a tree that she passed every day in the schoolyard in a completely different way. She never paid attention to the bark and the beautiful roots. And it had suddenly transformed her relationship with that tree and she appreciated it in a totally different way. This is, oh, I got a great comment here. Somebody says, you can connect this with geometry. And you're absolutely right. You can absolutely connect this photo learning with not just environmental um, learning or natural history. You could connect it with geometry and math as well. So my next project idea for you guys is to create a species collage. And in this case, you know, I think when kids start exploring nature and they start photographing these animals or these plants, they become really interested in learning more about the species. So what you can do is assign them to learn more about a bird or a plant that's found in your neighborhood or in your country. And you can have them cut out photos and write facts about this species and either create a print collage where they paste and glue pictures and text onto a piece of paper, or you could do this digitally. You could actually have them go online and create a blog or a web page or design using Photoshop. Some of you said you were using Photoshop to create this collage. And what I think would be really fun is to have your whole class do this on a different species, each student on a different animal. And you could collate all of these collages into a book that essentially creates a guide to nature in your schoolyard or in your community. So I think that that's a great way to get kids together to learn about nature as a group and to really take pride in the animals that are found just around your school. Now one of my other favorite things to do with photography is to use photography to study the change in seasons and the change in weather. So this is another way you can kind of connect kids to their surroundings. So what I suggest here, you only need like one camera for your classroom in this, in this activity. You could actually take a place near your school, maybe a woodland behind your school, or maybe just a single tree or a plant in the front of the school. And you ask the students to photograph it every day or every week or every month for your entire school year. And what you can see when you pile up these images is how the seasons change over the course of a year or how the weather changes over the course of a year. And so I imagine that this will really help connect your students to the seasons and make them think about how the climate changes in a way that they can't just by looking at a textbook or a picture, you know, a single picture. So I hope that you'll try that, and I'd love to see some of the results of that. So if you do that, please do send them to me. You'll have my website and contact information at the end of the presentation. So 
yeah, I see in my country, El Salvador, we have just two seasons, winter and summer, and I can try this idea. I think that's a great idea. It would be so neat to see how this works out in different countries around the world. And we could really create as a group this beautiful snapshot of weather and share that with each other as educators so we can show how seasons are different in different parts of the world. So this final project, which I really love doing with young learners, is to create a diorama. So um, in this case, what I do is actually create a list of different habitats or different um, types of landscapes. So maybe a lake or an ocean or a swamp or a desert. And then I have kids pick one of these pieces of paper out of a hat, and that's how they get assigned their certain habitat. Then we use a cereal box for the top of this diorama. So we cut open a cereal box, and then we use a piece of cardboard for the bottom. And then kids can take magazine photos, they can take photos they've taken, they can use paint and glue, and they can create a diorama of this habitat so they learn not just about a single animal, but about kind of the animal's home. Like, where does this animal live? What does it need to live? Does it need water? Does it like, you know, swampy areas? Does it need sunshine? So I think this is a great way to teach kids not just about a single species, but about how animals need healthy homes just like we do. So um, that's one of my other ideas for teaching environmental responsibility through these photo projects. It sounds like you all are already doing some different projects with photography. Now, how many of you guys have camera phones and use cameras on a daily basis? I'm really curious. I bet most of you at this point are using cameras a lot to photograph your kids, to photograph your families. Yeah, a lot of you. I'm just seeing the, the responses pour in there. So, oh wow, yeah, everybody's using cameras. Yeah, they're just so accessible. You know, when I started photography when I was 11 years old, I had to use film cameras. So I had to pay every time I took a photo. And that got really expensive because I didn't have a lot of money at 11 and I didn't have a big allowance. But now we have digital cameras and we have cameras in our pockets through our cell phones. So I have some quick tips for how you can teach photography. And even if you don't know anything about the technical aspects of photography. And the first thing is what equipment you need because I think that's a big question. Earlier, some of you were asking what kind of camera I use. So for a lot of these photos, I've of course used a bigger lens and a bigger camera. But for the photos in this slide, these were all taken with my cell phone camera. So I didn't need something special. And that's all you really need to teach any of these projects to your students, is a basic digital camera that's a point and shoot camera or a phone like this one. And that's all you need. And you can do it with a camera for each kid or you could share cameras with groups of kids. And so in this case, just think about equipment as a very simple camera. Now the biggest tip I can give you for teaching photography to young learners is to teach them how to hold their camera. Because the biggest issue I see with young learners is that their photos are shaky because you know they're just so excited to be out in nature and to have this camera that they're holding the camera out like this and clicking. So teach students to hold the camera close to their face, to brace their arms against their body, and that helps stabilize the camera so that the camera will not shake and the images will not be blurry. So in the other big tip I have before we get into some specific ways to improve the photography of your students is to have fun. This is really a way to get your students creative. It's art, it's natural history learning, we're learning about all different aspects of the environment. And the camera is really just a tool to bridge that gap. So really, this is just about having fun. You shouldn't feel pressured to know all of the technical aspects of photography, like aperture and shutter speed. So here are a few just really quick tips with some photo illustrations on how you can actually teach your students to take better photos. So focus on your subject. This is a really big one. Decide what your subject is and compose your image so that the subject is clear. So in this image, I don't really know what my subject is. Like it's a beautiful beach, 
But what I was really interested in was that small boat on the beach. So I got closer to the boat and photographed it this way. And that really focuses me in on what I was trying to tell the audience, my viewers, about. I was trying to show them this boat. And so encourage your students to think about what they're trying to tell. What story are they trying to tell with their images? And to get in closer. So then the other tip is to look for different perspectives. Find a different perspective. Look up, look down. Don't just be content with looking at something straight on. So in this case, I crawled underneath mushrooms. In this case, I looked down at my feet. Also try to find a frame. Just like we put frames around photographs, we also can put elements in our photograph around the subject that we're trying to photograph. So in this case, I use the trees to frame the mountain. And in this case, I used this path to frame this woman. And it really draws your attention to the subject. The other one is using leading lines. So how can we use lines to lead us into the image? You could have a road going off into the distance, a fence leading up to a deer, or this boat pointing directly into the horizon. In this case, I use the palm frond to lead your eye into the parakeet. And this is, once again, you could really look at geometry and you could really tie this, this composition lesson in with other aspects of your learning. The other really fun one is to shoot at a subject's eye level. So, you know, a lot of photographers will just photograph from above. They'll look down at a frog. What I do is look for a different way to show it. So I get down in the mud and crawl forward on my stomach and get right up in this frog's face very carefully so I don't disturb it, but so that I can actually show eye contact with the frog. So encourage your students to not limit you know, their, their mobility. I mean, they can really get down on the ground. They can turn upside down to photograph the sky. They can get down and make eye contact with their subject, their little brother, their pet cat or you know, a squirrel outside in their backyard. And then the final tip is to experiment. You know, really use digital photography and the wonders of digital photography and our ability to take as many photos as we want to get your kids to experiment. These young learners can take a photo of a flower from far away, or they can go straight in and get up close and look at the details. As Dave said earlier, I worked on this project called Nature's Best Photography Students for a couple of years that actually featured photography and writing by young learners. And the, the quality of their work was just absolutely amazing. They sent me photographs from their homes in Africa or in Vietnam or in Scotland. And I wanted to share this because you just never know what this experience in photography is going to lead to. You know, you may inspire kids to take their interest to an entirely different level. You know, my father always said that if we give kids the tools and encouragement they need, you never know what they're going to come up with. And I always look back to this experience editing this photo magazine because it really inspired me to keep doing what I do. I want to end this presentation before we take some questions with this final photo, um, which is a really important photo for me. Uh, this was a young girl who encountered this dead shark on the beach in Mauritius. And I watched for a long time as she was interacting with this shark. And I watched also as her mother came up and interacted with her interacting with the shark. And her mother made a lot of comments, you know, where she said, oh, it's, you know, it's disgusting. It's a bad, ex you know, get away from it. And of course, sharks are something we need to be careful with. But the experience of seeing this interaction really hit home to me that our attitudes and the things we say in front of our students, in front of young learners about nature are just as important as these active projects that we do. If we want to inspire environmental responsibility in young learners, we have to model our behavior towards nature in such a way that inspires this um, very clear, positive relationship. 
you know, if you have an insect in your classroom or a spider in your classroom, which I'm sure some of you have had before, I've definitely had one in my kitchen, you know, you can kill it and say it's disgusting and scream about it. And your students are going to see that. Or you can take it outside and release it and say, you know, insects don't belong in our classroom, but they're incredible creatures that can be respected. And so I think that that's a really good example of how we can use our attitudes and what we say and do and how we interact with nature to influence the attitudes and the perspectives of our young learners. So thank you all so much for your time this morning, for your comments, for listening, for participating. And I'm now happy to take any questions um, you might have for a few minutes. Um, you can type them down there. And I'm happy to take some questions and answer answer um, anything that you, you'd like to ask. So thank you. I see a lot of great, great responses. I got, okay, there's a good question. What are the challenges I've had so far as a nature photographer? That's a great question. So I think that, you know, a big challenge is being out in some of these very remote places. You know, a lot of times you don't have access to electricity. You know, so I'm working off of solar panels. Um, or it takes a long time to find some of these animals. So all of the photos in this presentation are photos that I took. And to get some of the wildlife photos, I might have to wait seven or eight hours in the forest to see that animal and to be able to photograph it. And so that's a, you know, that's a challenge, but it's also, of course, when you're out in nature, you never know what you're going to find. And so it's really, really fun to be out there. So I'm going to just pull up a couple more of these questions. Um, OK. Aha. What needs to bridge the gap from loving nature to conserving it, acting on insights? Yeah, I think that, you know, at least in my experience, when I've worked with young learners, as they come to be interested in wildlife, there's this natural progression of learning where they start to read and they start to ask more questions, where they start to say, you know, what can I do to make a difference for animals? I love animals. What can I do? And that's when, when they're asking that question, I think that's when you can start to give them some tips for how they can lessen their impact on the environment, how they can make a difference in their homes, you know? And, and really, kids have been, young learners, have been the ones that have inspired a lot of our great environmental movements in the country and in the world. In the United States, it was really kids who got their parents to start recycling. And so it's really these questions that they start asking where you can start transitioning um, to teaching them about how to deal with some of these bigger issues. All right. Let me see. I've got some more questions. Aha, do I think it's important, too, for parents to help students be more environmentally aware? Absolutely. I think that's absolutely a critical part of this. You know, you as young learner educators can only do so much um, in your classrooms every day, and I know you're doing a lot. And so I think parents can also be out there taking their kids outside, um, encouraging their kids to explore nature, and creating a good environmental ethic at home. All right. Sometimes, okay, okay, here's a good one. Sometimes um, kids take a lot of photos and it takes a lot of time to load them up on a computer. You know, how do you sort through all of these photos? Well, I think, you know, especially if you're a parent, you might not have this time as a teacher, but if you're a parent, you can actually sit down with, um, you know, your student, your, your child, and go through the photos together and talk about you know, why is this photo good? Why is this photo not so good? What could I do to make these photos better? Um, and I think that that can be an excellent learning experience in and of itself. It teaches them about art, it teaches them about self-editing, and it teaches them about how to get and critique their own work. So here's, I got a great question here. Um, how do I teach photography to students in countries um, where they're not English speaking uh, when I visit when I visit foreign countries. Well, thankfully, I do speak Spanish. So when I've worked in Latin America, I'm able to teach in Spanish. But I think the beautiful thing about photography is that it's really a universal form of expression. You know, just like some of you are coming to us here from Brazil or Argentina, you're connecting with images from Africa. And so what I try to do when I teach in other countries is I try to spend some time showing photos from the places around the world that I photographed, but I also try to show photos from the countries where I'm teaching. 
So I usually spend some time photographing um, places uh, where I'm visiting to teach workshops before I teach the workshop. So I can show kids that they don't have to go to Africa or Madagascar if they're living in, you know, Argentina or they're living in um, Costa Rica. They don't have to go across the world to take good photos. I want to show them that good photos can be taken in the places where they live. All right, let me see if I've got any more questions here. Sounds like some of you got to go start teaching. Um, so that's great. So I, I'm going to ask my young learners to use their phones, take pictures using their mobile phones, and then we'll discuss them in class. Do I ever, you guys are, you guys have so many great comments. Okay, do I, it looks like I might be on my last question. Okay, here was a question. Do I work with the IUCN and conservation organizations? And yes, absolutely I do. A lot of my work is done in collaboration with conservation organizations and with um, NGOs. And I also work very closely with scientists, individual scientists who are studying different parts of natural history or different environments. And I, I say that because, you know, I think a lot, in my experience, a lot of these local NGOs are just, they really want to reach young learners. They really want to reach kids. And so I'm sure that a lot of the NGOs in your countries would be willing to work with you and to help you take students out on field trips if that's an option that's available for you. But absolutely, that's one of the best ways that I connect with these stories and with these creatures is by working with scientists. So, okay, I think that's all the time we have today for questions, but thank you all so much for all of your time. And I really appreciate you joining us for this webinar, and I hope that you have a wonderful rest of the day. And I'd love for you to contact me and send me any of the projects that you do with your students. I'd love to see the results of this webinar.